So I get a lot of questions and comments on my videos and for the most part it's really great. I look forward to getting comments because I really love answering questions. Answering questions helps me sort out my ideas and it gives me an opportunity to practice articulating my ideas. As I've been saying all along, most of the problem with physics is not with the physics, but with the language and the interpretation. I want to create a language that is non-ambiguous and so we can all be on the same page. I want to stop arguing and I want to start communicating. So as you know, every once in a while I get a comment from someone that is eh, not so nice. And here's what I've found. Some people just want to argue for the sake of arguing. Some people want to argue against what I'm saying before even taking the time to try to see what I am saying. There's always another way. They automatically assume I am wrong. And that's okay. I'm used to it. But every comment is an opportunity. As long as you aren't calling me names or as long as you don't accuse me of lying or being deceitful, then I can take it. Okay? So here is a recent comment that I got from a viewer. Okay, it starts like this. And it's about my last video on that I did on Planck's constant. There's nothing wrong with the units in Planck's equation. This is especially obvious if you switch to natural, i.e. God-given, nature-given uh, units, where h equals 1 and the units for energy, mass, and frequency are the same. I appreciate your effort. Uh, I appreciate the effort you put into this video, but the arguments you present are wrong and the conclusions are ridiculous. Okay, so you know, a little passive aggressive there, you know, but you no, know, it's not the worst comment I ever got. And uh, this is kind of how I responded. Modified unit analysis does not preclude me from switching to natural units. In fact, using MUA, natural units have a better, more natural interpretation. And I'll show you that in a minute. For those of you who don't know what natural units are, I will explain quickly. In SI units, in standard units, the unit of time is one second, the unit of space is one meter, and is given the label M. The unit of mass is one kilogram, and is given the label Kg. And the unit of charge is one coulomb, and is given the label C for coulomb. These are arbitrary units calibrated for the convenience of the human scale. They are not natural. In SI units, if we make the unit of time Planck time and give it the label S, and if we make the unit of space Planck length and give it the, the label M, and if we make the unit of mass Planck mass, and the unit of charge, Planck charge, then you would have natural units. So this is how they do natural units. When using natural units, you can say that light propagates one unit of space in one unit of time. Light propagates one Planck length in one Planck time. So in natural units, the speed of light is equal to one. It's equal to one meter per second. But here, the meter is Planck length and not the normal meter. And S is Planck time and not one second. So when you make the unit of space Planck length and the unit of time Planck time, then the speed of light is equal to 1. In natural units, all of the constants of nature, including the speed of light, Planck's constant, the gravitational constant, and the Coulomb constant, are all equal to 1. This does not mean that they are equal. When you switch to natural units, 
the constants still have units. So the constants are not equal, but they're all equal to one. Of course, it would be ridiculous, and I'm using the word ridiculous correctly here. It would be ridiculous to make the unit of time equal to Planck time and the unit of space equal to Planck length, obviously. And this is the reason we don't use natural units in real life. They are just not convenient for the human scale. Modified unit analysis actually has two sets of natural units, and I divide them into two tables, as you can see here. Uh, you can find this in a paper I published a few years ago called Calibrating the Universe and Why We Need to Do It, and it's published in a Canadian journal called Physics Essays. So in Calibrating the Universe was actually the beginning of modified unit analysis. And so um, if you want to find out more about that, you can check out that paper. And uh, I'm not going to get into too much detail here, but I just want to show you the two tables that I came up with, the two scales of um, natural units. Okay, one set of natural units is calibrated to the scale of per cycle, or sorry, to the domain of per cycle. Okay, in modified unit analysis, I recognize two domains, the domain of per cycle and the domain of per second. So here are the two tables. One is calibrated for the domain of per cycle, and the other is calibrated for the domain of per second. Now you'll see, I'll point out just quickly, that Planck time and Planck length are in the per cycle table, and uh, Planck mass and Planck charge are in the per second table. And so um, the speed of light, Planck mass and Planck charge, and also Planck temperature and Planck frequency. So here I also in modified unit analysis have the domain of frequency and in the domain of per cycle oscillation is has the value one and in the per second table, oscillation has the value of Planck frequency. So I kind of see that as the clock frequency of the universal computer because I'm a computer scientist and I see everything as a computer. And so if the universe were a computer, this would be the clock frequency of the universal computer. Universal computer. So um, that is how I divide. This is how modified unit analysis does natural units. In terms of Planck's constant, all I am doing is I am decoupling or surgically removing the extra s, the extra s from the action constant h and allowing it to float. So here is H, and it has units J times second. So all I want to do is this. I want to write H T. So wherever I see H, I'm going to put a little T M for measure time. And I want to separate these two. Okay, I want to separate them, and then H has unit J, so now I'm going to put a little symbol there. I used to write Q, but now I'm writing a little triangle next to, to the H, and that means one cycle. Okay, so one cycle of energy. And measure time is assigned to the extra S, the extra S in in um, that was normally assigned to Planck's constant. And there is nothing wrong with me doing this as far as I know. Okay, so I'm going to erase these and I'm gonna write it, I'm gonna do it again, okay? So what I wanna do is I wanna write E 
equals H T. Sorry, that's not, I want that to be a T and the frequency F. So this is measure time and measure time is given that extra S. So this has units of J and this is H with a little triangle there that used to be HQ for quantum of energy, but I think cycle of energy actually makes more sense. So going forward, I'm going to be calling this one cycle of energy. And this is one measure time, which I am arguing was historically hard coded to the numerical value of one and subsequently hidden. So is there any evidence for this? And I believe that if you look back historically, and I'm going to show you this in a minute, if you look back historically, you're going to find that a one second time interval or one second measurement of an experiment was hard coded into this equation. So one second measure time was hard coded into the equation. And that's how uh, we ended up with the E equals HF without measure time because measure time was set equal to one and then subsequently hidden. But I take this one step further and I take this measure time here, I take this measure time and I divide both sides by measure time. And I end up with, I end up with an equation in terms of power. Okay, here's my question. Since the original black body experiments were reported in terms of power, doesn't it make more sense to write the equation in terms of power? And this is what I am doing. Okay, I exposed the measure time that should have been there in the first place that was apparently in Max Planck's original, um, original derivations. He wrote that and I'll show you that in a minute, okay? Since the original experiments were done in terms of power, then how come this equation wasn't originally written in terms of power? Okay, there's, that's all I'm doing. This is all I'm doing here. And so um, there's hardly anything different. I'm not doing anything wrong. There's nothing mathematically wrong with what I am doing here. So when people say I'm wrong, it makes me wonder, um, what exactly is it that I'm doing wrong? And um, if, if you can tell me exactly what I'm doing wrong, then, you know, I, uh, I will appreciate that. But I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong. There's nothing wrong with taking the extra, um, the extra S from the action constant and surgically removing it, basically taking it out and putting it somewhere else. It's just algebra. So for the sake of completeness, I'm going to do this one more time. Okay, I have the original Planck's energy equation and I'm inserting a one second measure time T. Okay, one second, this is one S E C, one second, which is why they didn't write it because it was equal to one and you don't write one in, in the body of an equation unless you have to. And, and for some reason they thought they didn't have to. This, and then I'm going to divide both sides by T and end up with power, with a power equation. I'm gonna put a little delta there to distinguish it from the action constant. This is now the unit of um, energy or one cycle of energy times frequency. So now we have a power equation. Now we have a power equation. And I think it makes sense to do this. 
All right, so let's see uh, what Max Planck might have to say about this um, one second measure time. Because in, in the domain of power, it becomes obvious that we're talking about the domain of per second. At least it seems obvious to me because power is always reported on a per second basis. So um, if you go back to, to this paper on the law of the energy distribution in the normal spectrum written by Max Planck and received January 7, 1901. Okay, this uh, paper was published and it was translated by this guy. Okay, this is a translation. There are multiple translations of this paper, but they all basically say the same thing. Okay, so part of the derivation of Planck's constant, or this Planck's energy equation, um, came from uh, Wine's, Wine's displacement law. Okay, I'm not going to show you the whole paper. You can read the paper yourself and see all the details. There's, there's a lot of math in there that might scare some people away. So I'm just going to show you the important parts. Okay, so it says, applying Wine's displacement law in its latter representation, blah, 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 and they're using entropy, one can realize that the energy element that should be proportional to the number of vibrations. And they're talking about, um, you know, the frequency of light. Okay, and then uh, we're going to skip down to section three where they do some numerical analysis. So they, do, they plug in some numbers. So it says the values of both universal constants, H and K, H is Planck's constant, K is, um, is Boltzmann's constant relating energy to temperature, may be calculated rather precisely with the aid of available measurements. Okay, available measurements means by experiment. Okay, so available measurements were used to deduce um, these two constants. So um, F. Kurlbaum, this guy here, okay, um, designated the total energy radiating into the air from one square centimeter. Okay, these are in um, CGS units, so they used um, centimeter, uh, grams, and seconds back in the day, so that's why it, look, why it looks a little different than standard unit analysis, but they're using CGS. So one square centimeter of a black body at some temperature in, and here's the key, in one second, okay, so they used a one second experiment and they found that um, they received an intensity of light and here are the units of intensity, okay, in SI units it's watts per meter cubed, watts per meter cubed, but so they're calculating the intensity of the light. And that's the intensity that, that they get for their one second experiment. And then later on, they, they, they want, they switch to, um, instead of, you know, intensity, they switch to energy density, which is what Wine's displacement law does. And they do that, it's a little trickery here that they do. What they do is they divide by the speed of light. Now the speed of light is reported in meters per second. So again, they're hard coding a one second measure time into this whole derivation until finally they end up with, with what they want. Okay, finally, finally they are able to calculate Planck's constant, okay, Planck's constant and Boltzmann's constant in CGS units um, using this derivation. And so, and then finally they end up writing, let's see if I can find that. Eventually they end up writing the equation E equals HV or E equals H times frequency. So, so here, here's another, um, 
independent researcher who discovered the same thing or who is writing about the same thing. Um, her name is Juliana, Juliana Mortensen or Juliana Brooks. Um, and she's got a couple of papers and she's talking about the same thing. So I'm just going to read a few little bits and pieces from her papers. Okay. Planck's quantum formula equals h nu is missing the variable for measure time. Restoration of the measurement time produces a more complete quantum formula. E equals Planck's constant times the frequency times some measure time. Upon balancing, this restored formula reveals that the numerical value of Planck's constant is actually the mean energy of a single oscillation of light. Okay, so um, she's writing um, joules per oscillation and I put a little triangle there. Okay, that's my symbol for one oscillation of light. Previous definitions of the photon relied on a hidden and assumed value for measure time of one second. Okay, one second. Quantum chemists, chemists of long ago, unaware of this arbitrary value, concluded that the total energy of a photon had to be equal to or greater than the molecular bond energy. And only photons in the visible and ultraviolet regions satisfied this criteria. Infrared, microwave, and radio waves were excluded from the study in photochemistry and were uh, relegated mechanically to a purely, purely thermal process. So basically a lot of assumptions were made about this equation because this one second measure time was um, surgically removed basically from the, um, from the equation. So here's another one of Juliana's uh, papers. So here she's going, going by Juliana Mortensen and not Brooks, because uh, she got married, I guess. Um, so here she's, she's saying that um, the complete quantum formula for um, Planck's energy equation is basically that, which we saw before. It's basically what I'm saying as well. Um, where H is the energy constant for light in joules per oscillation, or I write a triangle, and Tm is the measure time variable, which was hard-coded to one. Okay, so um, here I'm just going to read what she wrote. The complete quantum formula is quite similar to an energy relationship found in Planck's earlier theoretical electromagnetic work in the late 1990s. Okay, so he wrote that. So he had a time variable in his derivation and A would have been H at that time. Some constant times the frequency. So this is exactly the same as what we're saying here. Okay, uh, a, few year, a few years later, the time variable was lost in Planck's complicated black body derivation that used utilized Weinz law, Weinz displacement law, to um, basically hard code the t measure time variable to exactly one second. Okay, instead of multiplying the time-based energy measurements by the measure time, which you would normally do, Planck adopted Weinz mathematical methods which converted the power measurements power measurements, okay, power measurements into energy density values by dividing by the speed of light. This caused the measurement time variable Tm to be simultaneously fixed at a value of one second and then hidden because you don't have to write one in the body of the equation. Proof of these facts are found in Planck's 1901 black body paper in which he described the experimental data and mathematical methods, which is the paper I just showed you where um, 
where they specify one second measure time for the experiment they base their calculations on. So, um, so Planck had this. Planck wrote, Planck had a measure time, uh, delta change in time, delta t, measure time, in his original derivation. They, they used to use u for energy back then. So basically this equation is E equals H, and I'm going to put a little delta there, um, times some measure time times frequency. Okay, Planck had that. And so what happened to this? What happened to, to that guy? It, it got buried. It got set equal to 1, and it got buried. Um, basically, what I'm saying is the output of this equation, the output of, of this equation is, is a 1 second worth of energy. It's a 1 second worth of energy. It's the energy transported in 1 second. And that cannot be fundamental. That just can't be fundamental. And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with the logic of what I'm doing here. And, and there's some forensics to justify what I'm saying. And, and um, in my humble opinion, it's not ridiculous. In my humble opinion, it is not ridiculous. It is not ridiculous to, to write this equation in terms of power. Okay, this was originally how this equation should have been written. The units of power are joule per second, and the units of this equation are joules per, in modified unit analysis, okay, In modified unit analysis, the units of this equation, the right-hand side, are written like this. They're written like this. So I'm just going to show you one more thing. Okay, let's clear this out. I'm going to write that one more time. Okay, I want to write P is equal to one cycle of energy times frequency. Okay, and this has units J per second, joules per second. This has units joules per cycle, and this has units cycle per second. Now there's another power equation that looks very much like this. Okay, and this is the equation for um, power in a electric circuit. So this is P equals voltage times current. Okay, and this has units joules per second, of course. Voltage has units joules per coulomb. And current has units coulomb per second. This is almost exactly the same as what I'm calling the power equation of light, of this equation. It's almost exactly the same. Only the deltas are replaced by the Coulomb. So there is some relationship between these two equations. In fact, 
Um, if I replaced the delta with the Coulomb here, you would see that Planck's constant is actually a kind of like a voltage. And this frequency is kind of like a current. And current is a frequency. It's a frequency. It's a flow frequency. So there is a, a really, really interesting similarity, I think, between these two equations. And uh, this is what I'm, I'm exploring right now. So that's about all I wanted to say um, for today. I think we covered a lot of ground. We talked about the natural units and uh, we talked about how the uh, one second measure time was potentially injected into and hard coded into the Planck's energy equation and how looking back at even his original derivations that it's plausible that, um, that, this, that what I'm saying is in fact true. I don't think it's ridiculous. I don't think it's a ridiculous line of thinking. I think it is a line of thinking um, worth exploring, and I think it might lead to a, a better interpretation of light, but without being able to explore it, I, we will never know. And so my job is to explore this further, to take it to as far as I can take it, and um, you know maybe it can make a prediction about the nature of light that wasn't... Um, you know, predicted before that can't be predicted with the current model, and that would be good. But uh, I really don't think it's a ridiculous line of thinking. I think it's very logical. There are no mathematical mistakes. If anyone can find a mathematical reason why I can't do this, then please let me know. Um, otherwise, I will keep on plugging away. Have a good night.